but my name is Seth Ladd. I'm a developer advocate with the Google Chrome team, and I'm joined with my co-author and superstar tech writer, Kathy Walrath. <laughs> Thanks, Seth. Uh, we're here to talk about Dart and what it means for developers all across the different ecosystems and how they can build high-performance apps for the modern web. Uh, get your questions into the show. So first, you can use bit.ly slash dartcast, and that will take you to our moderator. There you can ask and vote for questions. Uh, please use this in real time as we cover things that didn't quite make sense, so you have other... Uh, questions or feedback, just drop it in there and we'll be monitoring that in real time. Also, Kathy will be on Pound Dart on Freenode, the IRC channel, Pound Dart. And that's a great real-time way to interact with us. Uh, we do hope that you ask questions and we're happy to take them as we go and certainly at the end. And of course, if, we have any, if you have any technical difficulties as well, let us know via these channels and we'll see what we can do to help. So let's get started a little bit about one of our goals in the Dart project. Dart helps developers from all platforms build complex, high-performance client apps for the modern web. There's a lot of buzzwords in there, so let's break that down. When we say developers from all platforms, we built Dart to be familiar and approachable to developers that aren't endemic to the web, that, that perhaps have experience in Java or C Sharp or ActionScript 3 and, of course, JavaScript. By complex, we mean taking advantage of the many different HTML5 features uh, available in modern browsers today. And certainly, the user, as user expectations evolve to demanding more interesting, uh, complex, full-featured apps, we're building Dart to help developers meet and exceed those user expectations. High performance is not just a game, game developer concern anymore. If you think about... Uh, building even a modest uh, web app today, there's a lot of things scrolling, shifting in and out of the page, elements uh, transitioning and animating, large data sets are being loaded and unloaded. And we want all developers to think about how to maintain a 60 frames per second, uh, silky smooth, jank-free experience. And uh, to really be aware that, especially with multimodal devices, touch and mouse interfaces, that responsiveness in 60 frames a second is, is everybody's concern. Client apps really speaks to putting the business logic and the code that renders the views and handles the user interaction on the client, not on the server. Uh, it's, it's related to a lot of these points, but one of the ways to get better performance is to stop the round trips to the server. Uh, and increase the responsiveness by running some of that logic actually on the client. Due to the significant improvements in speed and JavaScript runtimes, we believe this is now a very viable option, and uh, we, we've built Dart to help you build those client apps that actually run inside the modern web browser. And then when we say modern web, we're really drawing a line in the sand here and saying the only way to really push forward the platform and help users experience those apps the way that they really demand is to say we need to be working on the modern browser and by differentiating between the legacy browsers uh, that have the slower JavaScript runtimes and less HTML5 features and targeting explicitly the IE 9s and above, the modern Safaris, the modern Chromes, etc. Uh, we're able to now focus on delivering a fantastic experience knowing that we have the most modern evergreen uh, deployment platform as our explicit target. And we think that that's the way to really push forward the entire industry. So let's start off and remind everyone that Dart is an open source project. Uh, we're on GitHub. You can find everything on dart.googlecode.com. We launched early. Uh, you can follow the bug tracker. You can follow the mailing list. You can follow the... Uh, the code commits, even the build bots, and we have external committers. And so this is, a, this is an open source project, and, and we really appreciate the community's involvement already with their patches, and we look forward to helping shepherd even more external committers and contributors into the project. Now, one of the most important things to realize about the Dart project that is, is not only for Chrome. Dart compiles to modern JavaScript. This is critical. The modern web is on phones, it's on tablets, it's on desktops, it's on laptops, notebooks, Chromebooks. 
And Dart certainly is a new language with new syntax and semantics, but thanks to our compiler to JavaScript, you can write a Dart app and run it across the modern webs in modern web browsers. And so this is a great way, again, to bring in developers from all different platforms, write in a language that they find familiar and productive with, but then still deploy across all those targets that uh, help them reach their users. Dart also runs across the client and the server. Now, this is, this is really cool because we've seen other platforms that can, are able to share code between uh, the client and the server really help developers stay within uh, the language that they're familiar with and re reuse code across the client and the server. So thanks to Dart's virtual machine, you can run it on the server, uh, run your web server in Dart, share some core libraries on the server, and of course, run your Dart code on the client by compiling to JavaScript as well. So it, we really envision Dart as being deployed across the spectrum and helping developers really reuse code. Now, Dart is for modern web apps. If you're trying to validate, say, just a form and you just have two or three functions, and JavaScript, of course, is really good for that. Uh, but when we, when we think about the sweet spot for Dart, we really think about those rich client apps where the business logic and uh, the view rendering and the event handling, all that's happening on the client. Offline capable apps running at 60 frames per second, taking advantage of those HTML5 features. That's really um, one of those sweet spots for Dart. And so we like to think about how can we help more developers build for the modern web by building actually true apps. Dart is a very familiar language. This is a, a great slide for the O'Reilly webcast because it points out that if you're familiar with any of these languages up here, Java, ActionScript, C-sharp, JavaScript, you'll find Dart very familiar, and that's on purpose. Uh, we um, got a little flack when we launched Dart uh, last year, and people were looking for the next Haskell, but we wanted more than five users, and so we had to uh, look at the language and say, this, this, is a, this is the every man's programmer's uh, language. That is, it's for people who are already building apps today on a variety of different platforms. They should be able to jump into Dart and get up and running in, in just a couple of hours. And we've seen that uh, hold true across our numerous internal and external hackathons. Dart also scales from very small uh, scripts and uh, tests and experimentations all the way to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines of code, all the way up to those very full feature, taking advantage of the wide array of HTML5 features. And that this scalability of Dart is integral to how developers work on the web, which is very iterative. Oftentimes, you'll start with just a script and attach to your HTML file. You may not even have some CSS. And you're just experimenting. And then as you grow and some of these ideas uh, cement, you might add a little bit more structure. You might add some more files, and certainly more lines of code. Uh, as the idea really takes off, you add more developers, you add more modules, you pull in more third-party libraries. And Dart should allow you to scale all the way up to the very large. And, and from our experience, so far it does. So welcome everyone who's, who's just joining us. This is our uh, Dart up and running webcast. And uh, I want to remind everyone that this, we hope this be very interactive. And so please, you can ask and vote for questions on bit.ly slash dartcast. And join us at pound dart on Freenode. Kathy's standing by monitoring these channels. And uh, we'll get your questions in. So uh, we actually have one now. So when will we see Dart on App Engine uh, is, is the top question right now. That's a good question. So there is an open bug, I believe, on the App Engine's public bug tracker that requests this feature. I'm not part of that team, but I know it's a, it's a common request. And I personally would love to see it. I love App Engine. And uh, right, oh, so the bug is 6092 if you go over to the App Engine uh, bug tracker. So I, I have nothing to say really right there, but I would recommend everyone star that issue and, and vote for it and let them know it's something that you'd like. We'll take another question before we move on. I see, what are the plans for Android and Chrome browser for Android? And I, I think what Mike is asking is, what are the plans for Dart and Dart VM to get into Chrome browser for Android? Well, uh, first things first, we've got to get Chrome into desktop, uh, sorry, Dart VM into desktop Chrome, and we're working very hard to uh, see if that um, can happen. Um, but then to get onto Chrome for Android, we'd have to get an ARM port of the Dart VM. Uh, 
And I know in, sor in this open source repo, there is a shell for the ARM port. Uh, I don't believe it's working right now, but uh, it's something we, of course, love to see. So thanks for those questions, and, and uh, keep asking. So the big news with the Dart project is Dart M1 was just launched a couple days ago, and this is a great milestone for the project. We launched a, a, as a technology preview uh, last year, almost one year ago, at uh, GoTo and Aarhus. And since then, we've been working extremely hard to get the SDK in a more stable state, to listen to everyone's feedback about using the language and libraries, and we're happy to release M1, which includes many language changes, uh, based on feedback and real-world usage of the platform. It's also a way to think about it as a more stable language. Uh, we certainly anticipate adding features to uh, language features to Dart, probably at a slightly slower pace now, and we certainly anticipate uh, greatly reducing backwards-breaking changes. Uh, I mean, it's our hope to uh, significantly minimize those. Um, it's also a much more comprehensive SDK, and you'll see a lot of these features in the presentation today. But uh, you know, when we launched, we had just the basics, language and libraries and editor. Now we have package management, uh, integration into a browser, uh, a much smaller Dart to JS compiler, et cetera. So the SDK is now ready for people to start working on it. And really, M1 is a signal to developers that you could start trying this out because we're now on the train to a 1.0 release. We're out of the technology preview mode, and we're now in the, say, the beta cycle mode or the milestone mode. And so it's a great time to check out Dart again. And uh, based on all the feedback we received, we're, we're really happy where we are. So let's dive into the, some of the code. Um, here we're looking at uh, a very simple example of programming the browser with Dart. And so I, I love this example because it highlights a bunch of different features. First and foremost, uh, I think most people will find this very familiar code. I think everyone can read this code. So let, let's walk through it. Dart has the concept of libraries, and so we're importing a Dart HTML library. This is our binding into the browser. All Dart programs start with main. Uh, which is fantastic because the Dart, you, you really de define the structure of Dart programs. And so w there's a defined starting point for all Dart programs being main. And now our tools can uh, help you with development, understanding just where the program starts. You can construct new elements with simple uh, constructors. Uh, you can add classes, CSS classes, simply like you would add anything else to any other Dart list, add and remove and index of. Uh, we've taken the Dart libraries, like the core collections, and applied them to programming the browser. So now when you program the browser, it feels like you're programming Dart code, which is fantastic. Uh, On.click.add is our event handling, um, which kind of just reads naturally, which I really like. And then what you see inside of add is a... Uh, a, a one-line function. That is, this is the callback of what happens when add is, or when the button is clicked. And in this case, we just simply alert it's been clicked. And then, again, because we've taken the Dart core libraries like collections and actually applied them to programming the browser, you can add new elements like button directly to collections of elements that, for instance, in this case, to the body. So let, let's go actually go and, and run this demo here. Here I am in the Dart editor, and uh, yeah, let's do this. Let's create a new project called well, Simple Web App. Uh, the Dart editor supports creating the basic concept for uh, sorry the basic contents for a web app, and again, trying to just help us with that productivity. And l let's go ahead and delete this so I walk you through the steps here. Let's create a new button. And you can see, uh, just really briefly, that the editor is giving us real-time feedback, which is fantastic. So before I was finished typing button element, in fact, let's go ahead and do that, the editor is saying, hey, here's a warning. I'm not exactly sure what button elem is. This is part of that real-time feedback to keep developers more productive, which is great. I'm going to show off another feature of the editor here, code completion. So I can actually say uh, control spacebar, and it'll pull up the options available to you right now. So, of course, it can auto-complete button element for us. Again, just really helping you with the productivity. Let's see what else we can do with button. Uh, we can set attributes. Well, I, I'm going to set the text. So I start typing again, auto-complete or code completion kicks in. Uh, let's see, click me. Let's add an event handler. 
on, and you can see this again, code completing uh, on dot click. Okay, there's that dot add. Let's add that one line inline function syntax. E is the event. Uh, the arrow syntax I love for the for the one line functions. And let's let's just do the simple window alert uh, clicked. Okay. Now with that button added, what we've got to do is add it to the elements on the page. So we say document. And again, this where did this come from? The Dart HTML library gives that to us. Document.body.elements.add. And let's add the button there. Now, remember that the, uh, the editor will create the, the skeleton project for us. So let's go into the HTML file that corresponds to this. I'm just going to delete some of this cruft here. And let's go ahead and run this. Great. So you can see simple web app here with uh, click me. We're going to click this button here and certainly clicked. Great. So we just wrote our first Dart web app and run it inside Dartium. Well, as I, Dartium is our build of Chromium with the Dart virtual machine. And this allows you to get this very fast iteration between writing some code and running, uh, running the app, seeing it live. So let's just prove this. Let's say, you know, um, I wanted to say not clicked, but Dart is fun. So we're going to save that. We're going to run it again. Dart is fun. So you saw no compilation step. This very fast from editing the code to actually testing the app inside Dartium. That's because there's uh, Dartium is running the Dart virtual machine, so it can run all, all this stuff natively. But of course, as we said earlier, Dart compiles a JavaScript, so let's go ahead and show that off. Well, you can do that again through the editor. Right-clicking on the, uh, the, the main or the entry point of your app, the file with the main in it, you can scroll down and see run as JavaScript. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. That's going to fire off Dart to JS. This is our compiler to JavaScript. It itself is written in Dart, which is great. We're dogfooting our own language and tools, of course. And then this is fired off inside Chrome. Uh, this is not Dartium. You can see Chrome up there. And of course, when you click it, Dart is fun pops up again. And so this is really cool. So what we've seen is a lot of people write uh, their Dart code in the editor, test and debug in Dartium for that very fast, quick iterations. And when they're ready, that last kind of 5% of, um, of the debugging development cycle, they'll compile to JavaScript and test in their different browsers. And we'll see some more of this later. No. OK, fantastic. Now, certainly if you look at this code, you say, this looks familiar. This looks uh, almost tame in a sense. I mean, it, it's, um, it doesn't, this is almost code you, you'd see in almost any other language you're familiar with. So, but we also took the opportunity when designing and developing Dart to add in some extra new features as well. So we weren't completely conservative. One example is taking a cue from Smalltalk and adding um, method cascades. Method cascades are fantastic because they help you reduce reduce duplicated code and variable names, for instance. So let's, let's go back to the original slide. You can see that button was repeated many times. Button.txt, button.classes, button.add. Well, it wouldn't be nice if I didn't have to duplicate that button over and over again. Thanks to method cascades, I can use that double, the double dot syntax there and apply these different, uh, let's see, text equals click me, classes.add, up to the first expression before the double dot. And I really like this because the code is much more terse, and I can align things up better um, for a much more, I think, um, kind of flowing API experience. And so this just illustrates how, yes, the Dart language is very familiar, and most people are going to get up and running very quickly. We also have what I like to think of as some, some of the newer, nicer kind of additions as well. So we try to balance it out with familiarity, but also the newer, probably more exciting, uh, more helpful features as well. One of the, I think, most helpful features and probably most interesting features of Dart is its optional static type system. So let's just compare these two blocks of code here. The top block is without any optional static types. It, 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 we have used zero type annotations up here. So you look at something called recalculate origin offset estimate. Now, if you were given that code right there, it would be more or less completely opaque to you. Um, you have no idea what origin is. You don't know what offset is. You don't know what recalculate returns. And, uh, and so you could see how if you were to scale up to a larger team with more developers, 
you'd have to add a bunch of comments to explain what origin and offset is, and not every developer adds comments. And even if you did add great comments, and a lot of us do have great comments, your tools now don't know how to parse those comments. So what if you had a lightweight way to add in annotations or inline documentation that explain what these, what these variables might be, origin, what is offset, what is recalculate, return? Uh, and what if you did it in a lightweight, optional way so that developers can choose when to apply these type annotations when it most makes sense? Well, that's the, that's the theory behind Dart's optional static type annotations. They should be very familiar inline annotations or documentation that help your fellow developers clearly understand what the intent of your code is, but then also your tools now can take advantage of these things. And you saw that code completion earlier, and that was made possible due to some type inferencing of the Dart editor, but also it can do more when you an annotate your types. And so the bottom code there is also Dart code. Both of these uh, code samples are valid Dart code, uh, but the bottom one to me is just a little bit easier. So I know that origin is a point. I know that offset is a number. I know that recalculate returns a number. And then here's, again, some of the extra features we added on top of the familiar, easy to approach Dart language. The estimate here is a couple things. First, we know it's a Boolean. Wrapped in curly braces means that it's optional. That is, you may or may not provide estimate. And if you don't provide estimate when you call recalculate, it defaults to false. So Dart has optional parameters and um, optional parameters with default values, which is really, really nice when you're designing APIs. So, you know, you, you tell me which one's a little bit easier to read, but sometimes you're just exploring around, and sometimes you don't want to mess with the type annotation. So let me, let me show you an example of how you may flow from uh, just playing around, not messing with type annotations, to feeling more confident in using type annotations. So let's go back to the Dart editor. We're going to create a, not a basic web app. We're just going to say fun game. Let's say we want to create a fun game here. And, um, well, we want to have, I don't know, ninjas and pirates battle, probably. Well, the first thing they need to uh, do before you want to equip them, right? So ninja. OK, so I'm just starting to play around with my code here. Well, the editor, again, giving some of this instant feedback. He doesn't know about equip for battle. Well, I believe what we can do now is we can quick fix that, which is great. So uh, the editor can also say, hey, I noticed that you have an issue. For instance, I don't know about this method, and I love the instant feedback, but it can also help me take care of that. So I'm going to create that method, which is great. So now I have the, the boilerplate. So of course, it doesn't know what Ninja is, and so it uses dynamic here. That's actually a little bit verbose. So let's take that out. And let's just, we know we're going to take things called warriors, so we're going to clean that up a little bit. OK, so I saved the code there. And my editor is also telling, hey, I'm not exactly sure what, what Ninja is. So let's go ahead and create that class. I love the instant feedback. It's great. OK, so no, no, more, uh, no more warnings or errors, which is cool. But I, I want Equip for Battle to do something. So I'm going to say warrior dot, um, add weapon. Um, let's just say new sword. Okay, of course, it's telling me that I don't know what sword is, so... Okay, let's just do that. All right, great. No warnings or errors or anything, so let's go ahead and run this code. Oh, of course, okay. Uh, I get an no such method error, method not found add weapon. Oh, well, why didn't my er uh, editor tell me this? Well, it turns out that it doesn't know what warrior is here, so it's unable to give me that real-time feedback. But at this point in the game, this is OK, because I'm just experimenting. And I, I'm not exactly sure what my class hierarchy is or anything like that. So this is, the kind, this is exactly what I want. So OK, so I know that uh, I need to add a method here. So let's add, do this one. Um, print, we'll just print out here, uh, if you're reading this, you're already dead. No, OK. Whoops. OK, let's fix that. Great, so I fixed it, I, I addressed the issue, and uh, the program works. If you're reading this, you're already there. Okay, very cool. Well, so now I look at my program and I say, okay, well, I've got things called warriors. I've used that, I've used that word here. And I know I want to introduce some more, I want to introduce somebody for, for the ninja to fight. And so I, I'm more comfortable with the design of the program now. I've got, I've got some of my methods, I've got my classes here. So now I want to add more structure to my program so that I can get even more earlier warnings and even more uh, 
earlier errors to avoid that, that problem we saw earlier where I ran the program and it's like, hey, your method doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and create uh, a little bit more structure here because, again, I'm more comfortable. So abstract class warrior. And uh, warriors, you can add weapons. Uh, again, I'm, so I'm not going to create a class for weapons. I'm not exactly sure what the structure of weapons is. Do I want, you know, um, something above that? But okay. And then uh, I'm going to annotate here, which is really cool. So now I can tell my system more, aha. So as soon as I annotated my method, the editor goes and says, ninja is not assignable to warrior. Ah, this is the kind of instant feedback that I love. Uh, okay, well, let's go ahead and say implements warrior. Okay, fantastic. No errors. So let's go ahead and add, now that I've got my system more, a little bit more structured and more type annotated, let's add uh, somebody for Ninja to battle here. And uh, again, instant feedback here. A no such type pirates. Let's go ahead and do that. And so what happens, right? If I don't implement Warrior, I get the instant feedback. So I know it already. So I'm probably going to avoid that runtime error is exactly what I want. And of course, here it tells me again, uh, I'm missing add weapon. OK, great. I know how to handle that. Print arg. Great. Now my program works. I got all the instant feedback, and I didn't run into any one-time errors. So this is an example of how you would evolve from just experimenting and playing around uh, all up to more structure, more type annotations, and get even better feedback from your editor. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, yep. Uh, another feature that uh, we've uh, introduced in the Dart runtime is uh, a better way to address concurrency. If you think about even your cell phones today have multiple cores, and how do you safely take advantage of all the different cores on all the different runtimes running you know, that web browsers run on? Well, as we know from multi-threaded uh, shared state concurrency, it's very easy to get into a deadlock. You have to deal with things like locks and mutexes, and it's just it's hard to debug those. So we've taken a cue from Erlang and introduced this concept of isolates, which allows you to spawn functions into uh, essentially isolated memory heaps, uh, <clears throat> completely shared nothing state between these different isolates, and if you pass messages between the isolates, they can communicate. <clears throat> Once you've spawned your functions into different isolates, you can run them in separate threads or even separate processes. Let the runtime handle it. It's a much safer way because no shared state between these different isolates. <clears throat> Another feature we've added to help you scale up your programs in Dart is the concept of libraries. Of course, you can scale. You can start with functions. You can scale to classes and interfaces, then you can scale to libraries, which are collections of functions and classes. And this allows you, again, just to create more API boundaries and easier to fit in your head, easier to share code, um, and easier to share code even outside your organization or inside your organization. So first class support for libraries, very helpful for scaling up. Talking, speaking about libraries, the Dart SDK bundles a lot of great libraries like um, HTML support, crypto, JSON, logging, math, etc. All these come in the Dart SDK, and we're seeing a lot of other libraries launched in our package manager as well. There's two ways to run Dart code. The first way would be natively on the Dart virtual machine, and that's what you saw with our Dartium, our Chromium with the Dart VM embedded in it. That's also how you run server-side Dart apps. Uh, most people will deploy when they compile to JavaScript, and that's thanks to our Dart to JS compiler. Uh, we saw a demo of that earlier, and so you can run via JavaScript or on the virtual machine. Well, one of the advantages uh, that our Dart to JS compiler has is it also spits out something called a source map. And this is very fantastic because it provides a mapping between the original Dart code and the compiled JavaScript code. And then Chrome browser and its developer tools is able to read in the source map file and of course the JavaScript file so it can execute it, but then it can also pull in the original Dart code as well. And that helps you debug the original Dart code even when it's compiled to JavaScript. So let's run a quick demo of that now. Let's go back to a uh, simple web app and we're gonna run as JavaScript. <clears throat> And thank you, everyone, for putting in questions. We're going to get to those in just a moment. We're going to come to a break here very shortly. OK, so here is regular Chrome. Uh, Dart is fun. But again, you know, 
I, maybe I want to debug this application. First thing to do is make sure that you have source maps turned on, which I do. And if you go over into sources, let me get rid of this. Let me pull this up a little bit so you guys can see it. And if I open up the actual source files that my browser thinks is running, what do you see here? What do you see? Dart files. Well, how does it know about those Dart files? Because this is regular Chrome. All it does is run JavaScript. Well, that's that source map file in, in action. So here is actual Dart code uh, loaded up in the developer tools of regular stable Chromium. And just to prove that you can do really cool things with it, you can set a breakpoint on a line of Dart code, and we rerun the application. And again, this is running actually via the compiled JavaScript code. It's able to, thanks to that mapping, map a breakpoint set in Dart code to a breakpoint set in JavaScript, which is really, really cool. So you're able to debug the compiled application that, that you've built with Dart, compiled to JavaScript in Chrome Developer Tools, and stay all within that, that Dart code that you originally wrote. I should note that source maps is not just a Dart thing. It's, um, I believe other runtimes do it as well. And it's a, so it's, it's a great feature no, almost no matter what language you're compiling to JavaScript in. <clears throat> well, one of the advantages of, so, so that's compiling to JavaScript, which of course everyone will do when they deploy to Dart. But we also have the virtual machine, which brings along its own set of enhancements. Uh, for one is performance. For, uh, for instance, one of the great features of the Dart virtual machine is the support for snapshots. A snapshot is a serialization of the token stream of a parsed Dart code. We've seen that if you start from a snapshot, you'll see around 10 times improvement of startup. This is an example of starting up Dart to JS with source code and from the snapshot of the source code. This is a really great improvement for things like running on mobile devices where every CPU cycle really counts. The Dart virtual machine is also really focused on execution performance as well, and we've begun to exceed some of the same benchmarks that we track for V8. Here's just two examples. These two benchmarks, Richards and Delta Blue, uh, the V8's running at 100%. In cases of Richards, we have a little bit over 140% the performance. And uh, it's still very early. We're not faster on all the benchmarks, but just shows you that we're also very much focused on execution performance uh, in the Dart VM, and we hope to continue to improve this. Now is a great time to take a break and uh, remind everyone that uh, we love the questions, so go to bit.ly slash dartcast to ask and vote and join Kathy on IRC at Pound Dart. So let's take some questions now. So it looks like one of the top questions, does JavaScript generated from Dart run slower than if you wrote JavaScript directly? Are there any specific performance issues to be aware of? Fantastic question. That's from Todd. Thank you for the question. Um, before I forget, uh, Florian, one of our Dart to JS engineers, presented some of their findings working on Dart to JS at JSConf EU. And uh, hopefully there's a video for that. There certainly are slides floating around. So if you're looking at some of the nitty gritty, gory details of how they turn Dart code into JavaScript code from the engineers working on the project, look for Florian's presentation from the JSConf. Um, so every situation, of course, is very different. But one thing I can say is that the engineers that originally built V8 are now working on Dart to JS. So if anybody knows how to craft the JavaScript code that performs well on modern JavaScript engines, it's, it's these guys. And of course, um, it's, it's, it's like asking, can GCC compile my C code into faster assembly than I can write by hand? Well, in most cases, it probably can, because it knows a lot more of the structure of the program, and it knows a lot more about the different different CPU architectures, et cetera. And so that, that's, a, that's a job I want the compiler to do. And so um, I would expect that code generated by Dart to JS will run at the same speed as if you were to write it by hand. Uh, let's take another question. Could you tell us more about multi-thread support in Dart? Is it a system thread? That's uh, Owen, good question. Uh, I, I want to try to stay away from the word threads, because uh, that kind of insinuates a shared state concurrency model. So um, one thing to think about is you, you're gonna, you can spawn functions into isolates, and then those isolates are managed by the Dart virtual machine. It may throw that isolate onto a thread. It may throw that isolate onto a thread uh, pulled from a thread pool. Um, it's kind of up to the implementation. And so, uh, for or for instance, if you're running an HTML5, it might take that isolate and put it on a web worker, or or it may not. It's kind of up to the runtime and his knowledge of system and memory constraints, etc. But the main takeaway with isolates is they're shared nothing. 
you communicate between isolates with passing messages around, and the runtime itself will do the best it can to maximize the efficiency of running those isolates in parallel. Uh, is, uh, let's see, Owen also asks, is there a timeline for officially released Dart? Uh, no, we don't, we don't have a timeline. It's very hard to predict the future. I can say that we're working very fast. Uh, I think we ran some numbers and saw something like an order of, uh, an average of 30 commits a day, which is really, really impressive. Uh, and so, you know, you can track the project and look for the signals that um, you're, you're waiting for, but no, we don't have any public timeline per se. And uh, let's see, let's take another one. Uh, so Ross asks, does Dart do anything special as far as source code management? Do you recommend keeping the compiled JS code in revision history? Great question. Uh, probably not. I think mo most best practices around source code management is you don't put compiled assets into, um, into source code. Of course, everyone's own internal practices are different. Uh, I don't see us doing that right now. Um, usually these assets are generated from a build process. Um, but it definitely definitely depends. I, I don't see us working on that, really. Anything else? That's good. Uh, GUI framework? Okay, uh, Owen asks, are there any plans for building a GUI framework for Dart like GWT? Um, that's, that's, let's hold that question because we have a demo of that coming up. Um, so we've talked a lot about the Dart language, we've talked about the libraries, talked about how you run Dart code, uh, and we've looked already at the Dart editor. We've looked at a bunch of features like code completion um, and the static analysis which generates warnings and errors. The Dart editor is really where that productivity experience centers around. By giving you uh, whole program analysis, by giving you code completion refactoring, um, we, we think developers will be very, very productive. So let's look at a couple more demos of that. The Dart editor can also perform refactoring, and let's say that element, yeah, a button element here, and, and actually I want a better name for that. Um, you can have the Dart editor do that for you. You don't have to search and replace, so you can say, click me here, and notice how in real time it's renaming everything for you. I love that feature. There's other refactorings as well. Um, let's, set, let's set a debug as well. So we saw debugging in... Uh, uh, regular Chrome via source maps, but the editor also debugs as well. So let's set a breakpoint here, right in the editor, and let's run this simple app uh, in Dartium. So this is firing up Dartium with a virtual machine in it that connects to and talks to the editor, and you can see here the editor fires up its own debugger, and I can step through, let's see, let's look at click me, I can see, ah, four method get. I can step through the code here, which is really cool. And so, yeah, de editing and debugging all go hand in hand with its connection into Dartium. So I, I love this feature. The more I can stay in my editor and, and, uh, and work quickly, the better. Another big thing we launched with Dart M1 is our JavaScript interop with Dart. This was one of the most requested features we had, and we're very happy to say this is now available in our package manager, and you can try it out. So let's go ahead and go to... Uh, our GitHub account, and we're going to look at some demos of this JavaScript interop. We've got examples here for using Google Maps, using the Twitter API. Let's look at Google Maps. I really like this because it shows the power of our JavaScript interop. So this is a Dart app compiled in JavaScript that also compiled in the Google Maps JavaScript API. So just let's go from Seattle to Mountain View and boom, it's done. It's very, very fast. You can see lots of different steps. We're traveling quite far. Well, let's look at some of this code because uh, the way that we did it, I, I really like. It really makes programming the, uh, so I think I can increase the font here, programming the original JavaScript API feel like programming in Dart. And that, that's, that's the experience that we wanted to, to get to. So uh, right here. So here's the direction service. This is all Dart code. And using a proxy that we've created, that proxies the uh, original, here we are, the original JavaScript API uh, for Google Maps, uh, proxy back over into the Dart world. And so you've, uh, you've got to set up a couple proxies here um, and wrap everything in a scoped, uh, scoped um, function which knows how to handle the uh, object references across different virtual machines or runtimes like V8 and Dart. 
But once you've done that very short amount of uh, setup or initialization, you're writing Dart code, actually communicating to proxies back over in JavaScript. This works both ways. You can call Dart code from JavaScript. You can call JavaScript code from Dart. Uh, this works with JSONP. In fact, that's how the, the Twitter example works. Um, and so we're very happy to get this out and so guys can start inter integrating existing code, internal or external, existing JavaScript code into your Dart apps. Hmm. Seem to have lost my thing. But that's okay, because here we are. We're going to start this presentation again. Uh oh. Sorry about that. We're skipping ahead. Skipping ahead. Whoa. Sorry, bear with us. Whoops, one too far. Ah, <laughs> great. Uh, so we've, we've talked a lot about the language, the libraries, the editors, how to debug, how to run, how to write code, but how do you get that code out to the public? How do you get users to use your code and share it with the world? Well, this is where Pub comes in. Pub is awesome. It's our package manager. Uh, it's a package management system. It's a hosted service for packages. And it's tool integration to actually use these third-party libraries. It's how you pull in external code, third-party code, into your app. So let's run a demo here. All right, I've got my pub demo here. And uh, I love this because it really just makes my day so happy. So here we are. This is a very simple web app. And you can see the red. Uh, the red warnings, uh-oh, can't find these reference sources, package colon. So what's going on here? Well, I, I'm importing uh, three different packages just from random places out on the web, and I'm pulling them, I'm integrating them all together to build out a really new cool app um, and without writing much code at all. And so the first thing I need to do is uh, go up, choose my app, and I want to run pub install. So it's going to read my pub spec.yaml, which just declares all my dependencies. It's going to go find them, pull them down, put them in the right place, and then reanalyze all my code in my editor. Boom, the errors go away. This is really cool. So now we can run the app. Run in Dartium, just so it's a little bit quicker here. Boom, your life is complete. We've got kitten pics in our browser. But what's going on here? Well, we've got a frame here. We've got a widget here. We've got cat pics here. Each one of these comes from a wholly separate orthogonal package, which I love. And so we've been able to pull these packages together, integrate them into an app, and, uh, and reuse code. And that's what it's all about, reusing that code. And the, the pub integration is built in the editor. Let's actually show you pub.dartlang.org. We're now hosting packages. And you can file a bug in our issue tracker to get your package installed. And uh, we're working on the ability to self-publish your own packages as well. And uh, let's just browse through some of these packages already. Box2D, Dart Flash, uh, Bot, which is Bag of Tricks, JavaScript Interop. We're even hosting some of our libraries on Pub as well. Uh, again, dogfooding these experiences. Buckshot and Pure MVC are different MVC or client-side frameworks. So we think that a lot of the community interaction is going to center around uh, pub.dartlang.org. And we encourage everyone to package up their utilities, their libraries, their packages, and host them on pub so everyone can enjoy them. Oh, happened again. Oh, no. Here we are. OK, great. Cool. All right, and one of the questions earlier was, well, what about, what about a UI framework? What about widgets like Wit? Well, we've started working on uh, making web components come alive and work today with Dart. Now, web components are an encapsulation technique for creating new elements that encapsulate the structure, the behavior, and the style of new elements. And by encapsulating those three aspects of an element, you've now created a, a way to compose applications at a higher level. You can compose them declaratively with these new tags that hide the structure, hide the styles, hide the behavior from the application. Because if you think about it, when you create apps, and for instance, Gmail, if you view the source of Gmail, it's nothing but divs inside of divs inside of tables. Really, what you want to see is where is the, where is the message? Where is the... Uh, toolbar, where is the button? And you want to hide the implementation details of the toolbar, which itself, of course, might be divs inside divs inside divs. Web components will allow us to do that. It allows us to encapsulate and hide the implementations of elements 
And now you can compose at a higher level declaratively. Well, Web Components is a set of specs that we are all that browsers like Firefox and Chrome and others are working to implement at the low level platform, which will of course take a little while before it arrives in everyone's deployed browser. Well, thanks to Dart's compile step, you can write inside web write with web components today, compile it back down to JavaScript and HTML that works across modern browsers today. So let's see an example of that. Let's go back over to the editor. And we're going to load up to do MVC, which is kind of now the stock new uh, hello world for um, web frameworks. And so we've ported to do MVC to Dart and also Dart web components. Well, let's load it up and let's run the app just to show you what to do MVC looks like. And then we'll, we'll dive into the code real quick. We're going to run in Dartium. <clears throat> OK. So this is running in the Dart virtual machine, but this browser doesn't have web components, but this is all built with web components. So learn Dart, uh, build a pub package. OK, and I can check things off. Very, very cool. Well, how, how did we build this? Let's go back over to the editor. One of the things I like to show, let's show this. So this is the main HTML. This is the entry point to your, to your web app, and you can see these link rels at the top, these are the components that my application uses. We're just going to dive into a simple one here, the footer component. Well, or, or new form is probably going to be a little bit better here. Yeah. Let's pull up footer. Yep, very cool. So when we go over to footer HTML, it itself is a component. It defines a new element named x to do footer. You can see the structure is encapsulated inside this component. You can see the behavior is encapsulated inside the component. Here's actual Dart code uh, embedded inside of a web component as well. Very cool. So you can encapsulate them all together, reuse them, and then when you actually compile it through our Dart web component compiler, it will generate the actual JavaScript that you need, and it will generate the raw HTML that you need, making the web components a futuristic set of specs available actually today. So you can check out to do MVC in GitHub as well and play around with our web component uh, uh, implementations already. And uh, yeah, we hope you do because we're, we're working hard to make um, the future of web development declarative, declarative encapsulated renaissance happen today. So hopefully you've seen today that Dart is much more than just a language. There's libraries, core libraries, a rich and productive editor, a fast virtual machine, a JavaScript compiler, making sure that your Dart apps run across the modern web, a package manager, pub, browser integration, web components. It's a very batteries included experience, which I really like. And that's part of what that M1 release signals to developers saying, hey, we've built those extra uh, developer ergonomics that make getting on board and getting started with Dart so much easier. And once you're on board and started, uh, integrated into the Dart community with our pub package manager, reusing code, and just, just going farther and scaling up higher. Everyone always asks, well, what about the future of Dart? What's, what's happening next? Well, it's all a crystal ball. You know, this all is just very gazing into the future. But a couple of things we're working on. We're uh, looking at how to add mix-ins into the language. Uh, more library improvements and refactoring, continued work on Dart to JS uh, um, size reduction and speed improvements, uh, work on more reflection abilities, which is critical to more frameworks. Uh, but again, everything's open source, so you can follow along and, and, and vote for the stuff that, that you'd like us to work on next. Now's a great time to take a break and ask about questions. Uh, we definitely encourage questions, bit.ly slash dartcast, uh, pound dart on Freenode as well. So let's, let's see what we have. What do we got, Kathy? Anything good? Uh, how do I start contributing? Oh, great. Owen asks, how do I start contributing to Dart? Uh, well, first thing I would say is join the mailing list, uh, misc at dartling.org. Uh, and start bouncing some ideas around. Uh, probably the easiest way is to go to GitHub and start, start contributing some documentation patches. Uh, these are very easy to get in, and it helps you get oriented and familiar with the, uh, the structure of the project and, and what that kind of code review process looks like. Uh, so that's a good way to do. And then uh, you know, it should be noted that we do have external contributor. And uh, so with enough patches and um, 
you know, we let, we'll, we'll give uh, the commit bit. So yeah, we definitely encourage contributions. One page apps versus multi-page apps? Uh, okay, this is a good question. So far I've seen only one page web application with Dart. Any applications with multiple web pages and page navigations? Uh, so it's funny you should say that because we believe that uh, part of the design of the modern web app is a very in-page, one-page app. Uh, so you might, uh, so at least in terms of the user experience, we, we encourage people to develop kind of in-page transitions and avoid ever going back to the server to fully reload a page. That's a, a slow operation. We always encourage people to reduce network round trips. And uh, anytime you can do the transition or um, handle those button clicks or new application states on the client, it's, it's going to be much more responsive. Um, but you might be asking about, well, how do I do that? How do I how do I uh, keep the behavior and state transitions inside the page, but still uh, switch the user back and forth between you know, different holistic views? Uh, that's where the HTML5 push state and pop state uh, history API comes in. Um, I apologize. An, uh, an example doesn't come to mind right off the top of my head. Um, but kind of a related, one thing that we do encourage people to do uh, is in terms of checking out advanced HTML5 APIs is go to our GitHub account, github.com slash dart dash lang, and look for Dart HTML5 samples. So in there, there's, I think, more than 13 different samples. Um, and we should add a history API in here. But if you're looking about how do I, how do I take advantage of the HTML5 features, uh, like geolocation, like IndexedDB, like local storage, actually in Dart, then we can recommend uh, checking out our repository of samples here. We have a question here about databases in Dart, and somebody echoed that. OK, uh, great question. So how do I access databases in Dart? Uh, well, if you go to Pub, I believe there's a MongoDB package. Um, I ha and I believe somebody experimented with MySQL. I haven't seen anything production there yet. Uh, I believe this area is ripe for community contributions. We've been focused mostly on the language, the libraries, and the developer tools and web components for web apps. But you're right, we see Dart being useful on the server as well. And to do that, we need to connect to databases. And so we definitely encourage community members to port a MySQL or Postgres or whatever your favorite database driver is over to Dart. If the database has a RESTful kind of JSON-based uh, API, that should be very straightforward to port over due to Dart VM's native support for JSON. <clears throat> Okay, so how do you get started with Dart? We encourage you to go to dartlang.org. We've got uh, the Dart up and running, or um, uh, excerpts from Dart up and running, O'Reilly book there. We've got the downloads for the tools, um, lots of articles for the team. You can get to sample applications. So this is a great place to get started and, uh, and download the editor, which is the best way to get started because it includes the SDK and Dartium. You can also, of course, get one of the four books already out about Dart. Uh, of course, Dart up and running for ours, but also Dart in action for Manning, Dart for hipsters from pragmatic programmers. Uh, lots of different ways. If you want to really dive deep into Dart and its libraries and language, uh, check out some of the books that are already available in early release or published. And now the coupon. Speaking of Dart up and running, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we encourage you to use code WCYAZ. 40% off print, 50% off ebook. Uh, go ahead and check it out. It's early release, but we're in the last cycles of getting this out. You should get the print one and the, the final version very soon now. Encourage you to use this coupon as a thanks for watching today. Both Kathy and I really appreciate it. It's a lot of material to cover. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the community. Uh, the Dart mailing list, uh, plus Dart on Google+, at DartLang on Twitter. Lots of good ways to get involved. And remind everyone you can watch this and many other webcasts at uh, youtube.com slash O'Reilly Media. And so watch it again for the first time. So thanks, everyone. We really, really appreciate it. Again, we hope you continue to reach out to us on the mailing list, Google+, Twitter. Filing bugs at dartbug.com. Lots of good ways to let us know. Uh, we hope you got something out of the webcast. 
And uh, please continue the feedback and trying out Dart. We're, we're, we're really happy with this one M1 state, and we look forward to keep marching towards a 1.0 with your support and feedback. So with that, I think, uh, thanks, everyone, on behalf of the Dart team, and we're going to sign off, and we'll see you in the Dartiverse.